Jeff has pointed out that the stroke between our, my blue polygons is distracting. So I read that you agree with Jeff's aesthetic uh, assessment or not. Let's figure out how to manipulate that. Uh, double click on New York City 2000, right where there, and it brings you back to this symbology tab. If I'm in this area, guys, this is important. Right click anywhere in here. I prefer to right click right there and say properties for all symbols. Is this what you would do, Jeff? This is exactly what I would do. Would you go white here or would you go no color? I'd go no color. No color. He's the boss. So then we get this. All right? Uh, again, let's do that one more time. So I've right clicked in the middle of this white area. I say properties for all symbols. Over here, there's the fill color, which we're not going to bother with because it's determined by the college degree. The outline color is up for grabs. Another common choice is white. So right. it depends how smooth you want the map to look or if you want to actually be able to discern those boundaries, you keep the lines on there. If you want a smoother looking map, then you take them off. So I think at this point, I'll let you guys play with just the, the percent uh, educated. Get familiar with that dialog box. You're going to get exactly five minutes. It's 135. At 140, we're going to make a second core plus map that, that looks at the spatial distribution of poverty in New York City. And then toggle them on and off. So now I have whatever I just mapped there and there. So everybody sees I have two layers on top of each other, just like an illustrator, those two layers. Um, but yeah, so back to how do I get from one layer to two layers. I'm going to go from two to three the same way. I'm going to right click where it says NYC 2000. I'm going to copy. I'm going to right click where it says layers and I'm going to paste layers to add that third one. And I'm going to do it one more time just in case you got lost. Okay. Right click, copy. Right click on layers, paste layers. So now I have three, four actually. Okay, so let's find ourselves. Um, I'm going to turn all these layers off by unchecking them. And then I'm going to rename this one, the blue one that I like. I'm going to right click on it and go to properties. This is the one I mapped with my college stuff, my five class equal interval. I'm going to rename that layer in the general tab of layer properties, college education. And when I hit OK, now I have something that says college education. Um, and I'm going to minimize it. Okay, so forgetting about that for now, I'm going to look at this. So what was the next theme we wanted to look at? Was it uh, unemployment or poverty? I forget which. Poverty. Poverty? So I want to change this attribute to poverty. So within my symbology tab and layer properties, again, double click here if you want to get to layer properties or right click on NYC 2000 and go to properties and you should arrive at this familiar dialog box. And we're going to choose a robot code for poverty. I think we found it. All the way down at the list, the third attribute from the bottom of my value pull down list is total percent poor. Total percent poor. <coughs> Is that good, Jeff? Yeah, everyone's right with you. And when I hit OK, I can quickly reveal the spatial structure of poverty according to the U.S. Census in New York City. So who's familiar enough with New York to tell me which borough is most or least poor according to this map? Where has uh, from total like Brooklyn. Brooklyn over here to the east of uh, 
Manhattan. Definitely has some poverty. The Bronx. The Bronx, that's what this is, right? Yeah. Somebody help me out? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, the Bronx is the one I would, that jumps out to me as having uh, the least uh, or the most percentage of the population that's called poor according to some U.S. government threshold, okay? Obviously, just like with the ethical questions raised earlier, you have to question what this is. Who is the authority that deemed some, some threshold poor and some threshold not poor? Do you agree with that? Do you not agree with it? Do you not care because you're just trying to get some general trends? But as scientists and scholars, you need to think about these data. What is the census actually saying for poverty? What is poor? Some human being or some group of human beings in some office somewhere to, to decided that there was some threshold that meant poor at the U.S. Census Bureau, and that's what we're looking at. This is not authoritative any more or less than anything else that you would come up with. So, again, going back to our layer properties, we see uh, a bunch of numbers here in our legend that look like gibberish again, right? And this is because the default classification method is natural breaks, which I'm not a big fan of. Do you guys think we should stick with equal interval? Mm -hmm. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, so what has happened now with equal interval? Now think about, think about this is where we become actual people thinking about the stuff we're doing instead of <clears throat> we have, yes, so a really poor neighborhood, by my measure, would be where at least 40% of the people, that's a lot of people, 4 out of every 10 are considered poor. The map I've just drawn says a neighborhood like that is not that bad. Right? That's a two on a scale of one to five. That's what this map is saying. That's what equal interval does. Equal interval goes from zero to 100 and divides that by five. Regardless of the numerical distribution of the statistical operation. So when you look at a histogram in this classified dialog, you can see that a vast majority of these observations are within this first class, and a big chunk are within that second one. And we're using 60% of our classification scheme to deal with 20% of our observations at most. All right, so that's equal interval really gets exposed when the distribution of the data is not normal, when there are outliers. So there are a couple over here that are really depressed neighborhoods, I'm sure. But do we really want to divide our data this way? In other words, do we really want to have almost the entire map, the first and second shade of red? These are the, there's no right or wrong answers. That's the, the main lesson I'm trying to acquire. There's no right or wrong lesson. The only wrong answer is if you don't think about it and you just go with the default. That's the wrong answer. Use some logic. Think about it. For this one, I want to show you guys uh, one classification method that I haven't talked about. Uh, standard deviation. So this is a more scientifically grounded way of breaking up data. And you can see right away, maybe, that the areas below the mean are brown and yellow, and then a standard devi a half standard deviation to one and a half standard deviations are now green and dark green. Green, probably not the best color to equate poverty with, right? Maybe a better quality to, uh, a color to equate lack of poverty with. So if I wanted to switch that around, I would just go into my layer properties, right click, and say flip symbols. Now my richest areas are going to appear green. All right. So one of the takeaway points from, from this section of the seminar is just that there is no right answer for classification. You have an audience, 
you have a statistic you're mapping, and you need to make, make it work. This work for the newspaper, don't use standard deviation in the newspaper. Why? Only 25% of Americans have a college degree, right? So how many of them are actually going to understand standard deviation? If this is for a journal article, fine, use standard deviation. You see the idea of who, would, who is going to be your audience. It's just like you're writing. So in general, um, I wouldn't use standard deviation uh, unless you're doing some really scientific communication. I, I'm going to choose Quantile for this one just because we haven't really talked about it. And so, remember, quantile, if I have four classes, that divides all the observations up into four equal number of player teams. If I have five, it's five teams, six, and six. If we, if we do uh, quantile, look what happens to the Bronx. So now we see clustering in a different way. So I'm going to go with quantile. Okay, so 